So uh, I'll send my stay close to the mic just uh, so you can sort of hear me as I'm going through this. I just want to say particularly thank you to the folks at Vanderbilt here for, for hosting me and uh, giving me just a great opportunity through meetings this morning, this afternoon, to get a sense of what you're doing on campus and how you're looking at innovation and how things are changing. Uh, really within, within the context here at Vanderbilt, but I think also it's reflective of broader trends in general around universities grappling with what is innovation and how do we innovate in an age where everybody has a device at their fingertips and we sometimes uh, lose sight that while it's new for us it's become the norm for them and what does it mean in an educational setting. In particular I think I want to just address a little bit or start by talking about the vision that I have for education and uh, why I'm particularly interested in sort of the impact that this has from a societal perspective. So my interest in learning and the role that I want technology to play is essentially that it's a quality of life issue for me. First and foremost, uh, education isn't necessarily about getting a job. It's a nice byproduct if you get a job, but it's about creating uh, a quality of life primarily. In particular, I'm interested in exceptional quality research that, has, that integrates sophisticated data connection and begins to use an interesting balance between machine learning and human learning. And uh, it's where I think at a point societally where we need to confront the reality that yes, our future will be cyborg, at least cognitively. And the outline of the talk then, in terms of what I'll be looking at, is give you a little bit of background. And by I say a little bit of context, I mean about half the talk. And then I'll talk about digital data and distributed dimension to learning, and then a little bit about imagining our future, which I'll talk about a research project I did with the government of Alberta. So context. Um, I come from uh, a background in distance education. Uh, Athabasca University, where I still have a co-appointment, uh, is an online university. I teach in an online doctoral program. About uh, 15 years ago when I was in Manitoba, I helped develop the first online hairstyling program. And uh, that's not even a joke. It was uh, people, farmers, wives in this case, it was typically female, so it's not a gendered statement, but uh, it's a, farming is a family job. And quite often, once the, the winter hits, you have different activities. And, but it's not, a two, it's not a family job in winter the same way it is in summer. So partners uh, often wanted to get a different type of work and becoming a hairstylist was one, but they couldn't go to university or to, to college, I should say, to get that degree. So we shipped out uh, DVDs and uh, they met online in Skype and then they had a three-week residency and it was fully accredited by the government of Manitoba and that's how they learned hairstyling. So my interest is very much in a, organizing a meta question around what does it mean to be human in a digital age? So that's sort of my driving question that with Link we cash that out in three specific areas around new knowledge processes, around the future of work, success for all learners, and the future of universities. So we look at things such as how is knowledge created and shared? Uh, how are we going to work tomorrow? What happens when technologies outperform us? And even now, uh, there are a growing number of technologies that outperform us cognitively, even though that's typically done across a very narrow domain. So you hear about Watson, or you might hear about uh, the Go champion being defeated by Google AI. Uh, but these are typically very structured, but I don't think it's an unfair or even an overstatement to say within the next decade we're going to lose our cognitive edge to, to computers and virtually everything every field, largely because of the exponential capabilities. Uh, we as humans, when we die, the next generation has to relearn everything. Uh, computers don't have that dying problem, which may be a bad thing. Um, success for all learners is another focus. We want to look at how do we make sure that all students, particularly the underrepresented population, are successful. And then, of course, how is it that we're going to learn in this type of environment or context? And to give you a bit of background, just so you know where I'm coming from, I'm going to run through these quickly. Here's a few research projects that, that we're involved in. Uh, one is a digital learning research network where we're focused on bringing together uh, top systems. So we've got Stanford, CMU, Columbia, together with uh, state systems. In this case, California, Georgia, Arkansas, and Texas where we're looking at bridging the research to practice space in a more effective way. We're also looking at part of the, the Smart Science Network. It's now called the InSpark Network together with ASU and with Smart Sparrow. It's a grant where we're looking specifically at what does it mean, from our end at least, uh, what is it, because we're the research partner in the grant, from a multiple perspective, what is learner success? Not just grades, but what is learner success in terms of, these are STEM focus, but in terms of scientific literacy, in terms of learners having the ability to think, strategize, plan, set goals, and so on. We we'll also focus our effort on discourse analysis, educational discourse together with a grant at University of Michigan and a recent one that we started with Carnegie Mellon on uh, looking at how different knowledge spaces, in this case we're looking at Stack Overflow, 
Wikipedia and MOOCs determine the, the roles and the structure of the software, how that determines how we create and build knowledge. We've been involved in the past, we've run different MOOCs, very interested in uh, how learners experience MOOCs when they're being creators, not consumers. First thing I found when we ran a DAL MOOC, which is Data Analytics and Learning MOOC, uh, about a year and a half ago, is actually learners hate it. But uh, still, it was an interesting research question. We're also working on a White House MOOC, uh, White House initiative, uh, initiative regarding uh, K-12 teaching application development. So we're very interested in different approaches to teaching and learning, uh, different ways of configuring our uh, students and how they interact with one another. What I mean by that is one of the big aspects of the digital environment is that it makes many existing barriers unnecessary. So the barriers that we have institutionally aren't necessary in a data or a digital world. The barriers that we might have between how we supervise students aren't necessary. So some of the things I'll talk about is when I say, you know, I have a student that I'm uh, supervising at Stanford. In some cases it means like we fund the po and we do fund a postdoc at Stanford, uh, but they're based out of Stanford and uh, we supervise them, but it's this idea that we don't need to be institutional centric or specific. A key area that we're just turning more attention to is a new initiative in the lab called AWARE, where we're looking at expanding data collection through wearables and wearable devices. So we do look at EEG and eye tracking and uh, heart rate variability and galvanic skin response and other tools. So the, the Empatica E4 for ongoing data collection is part of a longitudinal study we're going to be deploying in fall. But it's basically recognizing that there's a lot that we're not capturing when we're involved in MOOCs. There's a lot of uh, data that may give indications and clues to affect and social dimensions that we're currently not capturing. CERTL, you folks are involved with this as well, so you're likely familiar with it. That's a little bit of our background in terms of, of Link as a project. Now the reality today is basically work is changing and more and more work, according to a uh, recent uh, World Economic Forum report, is going to be work that is creative, collaborative, it requires complex uh, skill solving, it requires a high level of social skills, the ability to work together and to work with one another. And the reason why that's important is reflected in this particular, these next couple images. This is the major industry by highest employment in 1990 in the US, primarily the blue equals manufacturing. This is the same map by primary highest employer in 2013. So in a span of about less than 25 years, you've basically had a complete shift in who are the prominent employers uh, in most of the states. And that doesn't come without some significant human resource concerns. How do you take a group of people, a society if you will, where you've had this massive upheaval because there's not necessarily a direct link between being a manufacturer employer on an assembly line versus attending to grandma in, in a health facility. So there are skills and knowledge needs and deficits that need to be addressed in this particular process. And that's also being reflected with a number of systems today that are becoming completely dependent on knowledge related work. So in the US for example, less than 15% of traditional labor fits into uh, production type of work. Even in China where many of these works are, the types of work have been outsourced, still has less than 50% of its work fitting into a traditional production type of work as well. Um, I, by the way, if any of you want slides, I'll share them with, with I guess, with Derek and he can uh, send them on to whoever might want to have them. The citations are all in the notes if you're looking for specifics. In addition to the changing role of work, changing economic structures, we also have different students. Our student profiles are changing and broadening. Less than 50% of students in the U.S. now fit a traditional full-time basis, and more and more these kinds of educational systems favor women over men, and there's change in terms of the top countries where individuals are entering, but also, interestingly, the average age of entering university is increasing in most systems. We'll likely see in the future that instead of a four-year relationship with our students, we have something like a 40-year relationship where they, they keep coming back, they enter the labor market, come back to reskill, into the labor market, come back, and so on. There's requirements here for higher education. We need to look at these changing demographics and respond to them more significantly. We have more students with more varied backgrounds entering higher education. That's all good, right? Because it's well supported by the government. Well, actually not really at all. Um, we've seen a massive reduction in state support in public education across the board. Uh, so whereas in 2005, we're sitting at nearly 62%. Today, we're sitting at 51% in terms of state support. That's a challenge, particularly because to be a participant in a knowledge age, an age of creative work, you need an education at a level that you've never had 
had to re uh, have in the past. So if you don't have an education, the doors of opportunity continue to get smaller and smaller. Now, the U.S. Department of Education says, well, we need to do something to change this. And so they've started uh, financial aid programs that are now available to things like boot camps. If you're familiar with boot camps, basically you sign up to learn programming, for example, and then you have an intensive, could be three-month or six-month experience. You'll pay a lot for it. It's not cheap at all. You'll pay a lot for it, but you'll spend 80 hours a week learning how to program. And some of these boot camps have success or uh, rates of employment that approach 100% because they're very effective at giving people programming skills and making them ready for the labor market in that regard. <laughs> Um, there's also, though, in addition to these changing models, so with the Department of Education, there's the boot camp relationship is if you're funded or there's options to receive funding for boot camp work if it's affiliated with the university. So once dollars change, then the university system will change as well. So where dollars flow, innovation typically flows. Well, in many of these instances, you also have a large number of organizations from the venture capital firms that are turning their attention to Newton and Luminosity and Straighter Line and Parchment and uh, whatever else is happening. So there's an enormous flow of capital into the university system that we have haven't had in the past and the list just keeps going on. So we have significant number of individuals in this space and we also have absolutely no lack of hype. So there's a recent article in Inside Higher Ed, The Future Is Now. This remains my absolute favorite comment I've read on an educational article. And, uh, <laughs> and so you see a lot of angst societally. You see a lot of angst within the university system around what are we supposed to be. You see a whole new range of competitors from startups, changing funding models, increased venture capital dollars, and the list goes on. So it makes a lot of sense that we have a bit of collective angst around what higher education is becoming. But to me, it still brings back this, this really critical statement of President Truman, uh, is that if education is required to get a job, and it is, then all of a sudden education, if it's too expensive and priced out of reach, education becomes a means of deepening race and class distinctions rather than eliminating them and providing broader access. So for me, that's the sort of the moral imperative in trying to address that. By and large, then, we end up with something that looks like we have a complexification of higher education. We have more people needing education and we have more people that are uh, needing education longer or returning to it even after they have the bachelor's and providing other options. Another way to look at it is to take a traditional learning or knowledge framework where most of what we've done, so you've got you know, daily sense making, how to make sense of our lives, you know, being parents, mapping to existing knowledge, which is the process of being involved in the university sector. But then we have on the right side these areas that are much more intractable. So we have crisis situation. This is what happens when, whether it's a terrorist attack or whether it's a natural disaster, but it's how do entire systems evaluate a situation and apply knowledge to respond to it effectively. One illustration of this would be uh, what happened with the Ebola outbreak, where you have a new situation arise and we don't know what it is and what to do with it and how to respond to it. Right now we're having that with, uh, the, is it the Zika virus? I don't know how you pronounce it. I, I had a, I read probably my favorite statement on Twitter the last little while has been, whenever someone mispronounce a word, I'm encouraged to hear it because it means they learned it through reading. So just you know, give me some slack if I mispronounce that word. So anyway, it was new. So, and, and then of course new knowledge, which is research. Traditionally, the university system has tried to address these quadrants, and that means that our learning needs were intended to help us better function as members of society, but also to understand what's already known. Almost everything now in the future of work resides in quadrants that relate to crisis or new knowledge opportunities. And that means that we have to reorient the intent of a university the way it's traditionally been to what it's becoming. But it's not an easy task because on the flip side, we have a far greater focus on practical skills. The narrative today is get a job, get a job. University should help us get a job. And yet the most important skill that's needed is the ability to continue to stay relevant. So it's actually conceptual frameworks rather than specific programming skills that are most relevant for the long-term success of an individual. That's my background. So digital, what's happening? Well, in that regard, one of the biggest things that's been going on is through digital technologies, whether those are mobile devices or whether that's just what is now, I guess, called social media, used to be Web 2.0, we're starting to see a far greater focus on individuals having control. So through 
my access to TED Talks or through MOOCs or through just YouTube or a faculty member's online textbook or whatever else, I have far greater self-regulated learning opportunities than I've ever had access to. And that's a shift in autonomy. Much like Kant emphasized that when an individual is enlightened, it means when they can do for themselves what used to be done for them by society's institutions. In a similar regard, from a learning enlightenment perspective, if we will, there's a lot that we can do around information seeking and finding that used to be done for us by a faculty member. We also have, again, this range of technologies from MOOCs to social media that allows us to learn collaboratively. And that's just amplifying with adoptions of ambient computing, virtual reality, Internet of Things, and wearable devices. And just to put it into perspective, the scope is enormous. In 1995, I'm not sure if you've ever seen one of these, uh, you know, Good Morning America videos where someone's trying to explain what is the Internet. Uh, you know, and at one point where, where you know, 35 million uh, Internet users just, you know, just an insignificant part of the population. At that point, the vast majority, 61%, was the US to today where you've got 2.8 billion users, 39% uh, uh, population uh, penetration. And to make it even more significant, uh, mobile devices are, are absolutely explosive in that regard as well, moving from 80 million to 5.2 billion. So basically, it's a data-driven world, or a, a digital world, where everything that we're doing, devices, technology, and otherwise, is creating trails of data that are now being used by, by organizations to make sense of it. My interest in that regard is around the use of data in this particular uh, experience. So from an education setting, I think there's two dominant trends that we are going to see having a dramatic impact on the future of the university from a learning lens. The first one relates to neuroscience. Uh, neuroscience. A lot of interest and activity obviously coming around in neuroscience where we're getting a better understanding of how we learn, what happens when we learn, optimal conditions, developmental conditions for learning, the idea of when numeracy and literacy are better set. And so uh, the neuroscience implications are significant. There's a lot of research happening within neuroscience. There are uh, emphasis around greater uh, priorities of taking uh, laboratory driven research and moving it out into a classroom setting more effectively. Hasn't been done as well as we had hoped, but it's, it's happening. There's a lot of emphasis now that maybe we've misunderstood things like morality and even creativity. For example, somebody who ends up doing something completely inappropriate, like killing lots of people, may have a brain lesion and may actually not be making a willful choice to be that kind of a person. So it's changing and will continue to change these aspects in um, in our legal systems, in our school systems, and so on, that we haven't thought of in the past. It also has an emphasis on looking at multi-pathway and multidisciplinary models in terms of education impact. But there's a real thing to be cautious of. So while neuroscience has a big potential for large impact on how we understand developmental stages involved in learning, uh, there's also a real risk that neuroscience is a term that is easily misunderstood and appropriated by those who want to use it as a way of broadening their influence, like luminosity, brain-based. You ever heard the term brain-based learning? I mean, it's, you know, yeah, I mean, what are the other options? You know, like, you guys are all engaging in butt-based sitting right now. I mean, it's like, but anyway, um, so, but there's, there's a lot that going, we have to be cautious of this. So there's one study that looked at fMRI data uh, that took a dead salmon, so the researcher went, took, took a dead salmon, and uh, did a series of F fMRI scans on the salmon while it showed it different pictures, and it showed which parts of the salmon's brains were illuminated as it showed it the dead picture, or the pictures to the dead fish. So there, there's this, this kind of a view that, that we have to be careful what we're seeing. Another study that looked at it was called the seductive allure of neuroscience explanations. It took a group of students and gave them an explanation of something, and, and one was notably fabricated, and most students understood it was nonsense. Then they took that exact same explanation with a similar profile of students and added neurospeak. Something like, research in the neocortex reveals that, and all of a sudden people would say, oh yeah, that sounds about right. So uh, it's worth noting that we want to be a little careful with neuroscience, but I'm just saying that's one lens. Neuroscience has a very deep end, so if you have somebody, if you're taking an fMRI scan, uh, and it's, it's, uh, the data you're collecting is, is enormously complex, but it's a small end. You're getting, you can only put so many students through, through uh, a machine on a given day for fMRI scans. Uh, it's a very small end, so there's always sampling issues and so on. 
On the flip side, we have this idea of data and big data, and this is an absolute mess, probably no, no worse than uh, what we get with some of the neuroscience explanations, but the emphasis with a, with a data approach, so the one I mentioned was neuroscience is one avenue to understanding learning research, the second avenue is around uh, the use of analytics and learning analytics in the educational process. In this case, we're looking at larger data sets, fuzzier stuff, uh, we're more tolerant of incomplete data, and we're emphasizing scale and inferential models. Now, we have the same issues. So, for example, there's the mind-reading robo-tutor in the sky, which was in reference to the Newton software, uh, which was a, the, the CEO claimed that, that they had mind-reading software. And so statements like this come along where you start to wonder, and this was a colleague uh, that had promoted and said, this is essentially sake, uh, snake oil. Like, we're making promises that we don't quite have the ability to support with data. But it's, you know, times of hype. This is exciting times when you can make up stuff. It does, it does present a challenge though, and so from our interest, there's a real lack of data-informed decision-making culture. There, th this isn't a, an irrelevant challenge that we're facing. So for individuals that are in a university setting making decisions about how to improve teaching practices, there is a lack of informed decision-making uh, culture that, that uh, we can look at from a data perspective. And it's important to recognize that learning analytics has almost an, an odd relationship. On the one hand, we want all the data we can get to build and evaluate models of learners, but on the flip side, we always have to reduce it to an N of one in terms of our interventions and our intervention strategy. So really going big to go small. Uh, and uh, from that end, it's, it's worth recognizing that one approach doesn't work with everyone in a certain type of, a, of an educational setting. And different learners based on uh, social, psychological profiles are going to respond differently to different types of interventions. So together with a colleague from Columbia, Ryan Baker, we put uh, this in the Cambridge Handbook of Learning Sciences. We emphasize sort of what are the main techniques that we're involved with when we're engaging in these kinds of activities, in, in learning analytics specifically. So it's around discovery, it's around prediction, it's around understanding relationships, whether that's between data or between uh, learners in terms of uh, making recommendations of who you might want to interact with. It's discovery with models where we're trying to uh, make sense of a new problem space based on models we've created and other problem spaces. But ultimately a big part of it still is that, you know, the fifth point here, which is that we want to dis uh, distill for human judgment. We want individuals to make choices and decisions on it. So when we're involved in learning analytics practice, and I'll run through a series of slides quickly on these elements in a bit, but these are essentially the things that we're engaged in. We're trying to use data to make sense of learning experience to improve student satisfaction. In particular, we want to be aware of what works and when. Like the last thing we want to do is scale through humans what should be scaled by technology. Right? There are certain things that, that through MOOCs or, or through different online technologies we can scale rapidly. Why duplicate that through human intervention? On the flip side, there's instances where we try to scale through technology which should be done by humans. And uh, so it's this idea that we use machine learning for human learning. And uh, that's an important point where we want to look at where we intervene. And a lot of these systems now are focusing or broadening their data collection. Initially, we heavily emphasized log data or click stream data. And now with a growing number of emerging physiological and physical sensors, we're starting to see a range of other approaches that will give us data about individual students. The big challenge that we face here, though, is that many of these multidimensional uh, data sources aren't integrated well. So for example, if a student, if you're using screen or, uh, uh, facial software to recognize detection of emotion, the act of being surprised has about a one to two or three second persistence. It's very short. The act of being bored can last 30 seconds or more. So if you're looking at, let's say, EEG data combined with heart rate data, combined with galvanic skin response, combined with facial recognition software, um, even being out a fraction of a second can reduce the validity of the results that you have. And we don't have a means right now, or certainly don't have a database of locking these devices in. Even if I'm wearing a Fitbit, we'll have a different time locking sequence than wearing uh, an E4 uh, will. And so th this, the issue is that we, when we're dealing with fraction of a second in responses, we're not going to be able to do that effectively until we have better uh, approaches to capturing this data into a central environment. 
But the, by, and the secondary challenge of this is that we just don't have enough uh, learning analytics practitioners in this space to be able to meet some of these needs. So uh, Ryan had a doctoral student look at job postings in New York. With over 150 postings in learning analytics uh, jobs in New York alone, we're graduating less than 30 uh, students uh, in the master's and a, and a doctoral level globally every year. Anyway, so let's look briefly at what are learning analytics more practically then. So there's basically four elements that we look at. We uh, see this from the lens of a personal learning graph. Namely, we want to be able to architect or at least model what an individual knows uh, as effectively as possible. And it's more than just the cognitive dimension. If education is only cognitively conducted, then for lack of a better term, we'll eventually meet our future AI overlords halfway. We really need to look at process, engagement, and the social components of that experience. One of the challenges that many universities face, and they haven't really addressed this well, is the idea of enabling or a systems layer. These are the technologies that you use, the data that you have access to, and the development of both faculty, uh, students, and uh, I guess leadership as well. So the enabling layer is one to look at, but it's out of scope for what I want to look at. I just want to reference it briefly. So from a learning perspective, there's obviously the teaching, the feedback, the assessment components. There's the uh, idea of content that we obviously still use as a part of the education process. And then there's the idea of a learner profile. If you look at most adaptive learning companies today, they have the simple relationship of a rudimentary learner profile compared with some architecting of a knowledge space. Often in science fields, because that's easier to architect, there's less ambiguity, and ambiguity is typically a nemesis of most algorithmic uh, approaches to thinking. But this is current adaptive learning. So you have your teaching practices, your evaluation feedback practices, and then you try to emphasize content and learner profile connections to create your personalized or adaptive learning models. From an educational perspective, our view, uh, at least within Link and with, with colleagues in the learning analytics field, is one that really emphasize learning analytics as a way of uh, commenting on and providing real-time feedback to teachers about what they should be doing or what they are doing. Like for me, I'm not sure what I would necessarily do with it, but you know, if I had all of you properly rigged up, I could uh, see where's your heart rate at, is there any variability, are you getting bored, some of you are looking kind of sleepy, where are your, uh, what are you looking at in terms of attention on the screen, what are you paying, and some of you are looking at your screen doing your email and stuff, which is what I would be doing if I was in this lecture. And so, but there's all different activities activities that, that you're involved with that can give feedback to the teacher in terms of how do you respond. Clickers are a terrific device. I mean, Carl Wyman's work around the use of clickers in the classroom and in physics and other chemistry in those subjects have been you know, very effective in demonstrating the value of brief moments of engagement through pauses that cause students to think. So it's teaching feedback. There's evaluation feedback. So one of the things here that's quite interesting for me at least is a large number of organizations try to emphasize dashboards for students. They're really Universities and uh, business leaders, they're hyped on dashboards. I don't know why dashboards are such a big thing, because they're crap usually. In fact, in many cases, watch somebody with a dashboard. You give them a dashboard that says, here's data, and they'll click three or four buttons, they'll look at it and they'll say, huh. And then they'll be done with it. They'll never go back to the dashboard again. And so one of the things that we're starting to look at is recognizing that if you do analytics on your analytics, you kind of have to listen to the results that you find. And so we're turning now more and more to emphasizing with a colleague at the University of Sydney that we want to take feedback that's actionable for each individual student. And in this case, we're looking at data that it provides like an email that says, here's what you should be doing next. Rather than giving a visualization of who knows what that they don't make sense of, giving them, this is what you ought to do next. This is the next step. So text-guided feedback rather than a dashboard. But again, these are things that you learn as you engage with these activities. Uh, the same holds true with a content and a learner profile. The big thing that we're missing educationally, and the next big thing you'll hear more and more about over the next few years in education settings, is that of a learner profile. We're calling it a personalized learning graph, but it's just a measurement and a way of architecting what a student knows. A persistent identity that lasts beyond a class, beyond a university experience, almost like a medical record that has a uh, you know, place of birth and a place of whatever where you keep adding details to it, which when you think of it makes a lot of sense. In five years from now, a student graduates, enters the labor market, she works as a programmer, all of a sudden something changes in the, in the marketplace, she wants to get, I don't know, whatever comes after AI or whatever comes after deep learning, so she decides she wants to get into that field 
field, but she doesn't want to take two years off to do that. She doesn't want to do it 100% online. So instead, you've got a personal learning graph that's been mined from the interaction she's had in email, the reports that she's contributed to, papers she's co-authored with others, and so you have a reasonably up-to-date list of what she knows. She goes to university, the university looks at a profile, runs it against their entire curriculum and says, well, in four months you could be an expert in this field, or in six months you could be an expert there, and so on. So it's just this idea that a, a persistent, long, lifelong identity of what we know starts to become quite critical. Other aspects relate to this, of course, uh, engagement. Student engagement is a huge factor in terms of determining success. So, um, again, Ryan Baker, who I've mentioned, uh, he's looked at students' engagement at a young age and how that impacts their future success. Students who demonstrate the ability to basically focus for a period of time across numerous affective measures uh, succeed much better later in life. Less impulsiveness, less uh, you know, risky decision making, uh, less uh, issues of dropout and so on, just measured by their ability to focus and to stay uh, on task for a period of time. So how do we manage engagement and model engagement through that? And then, of course, through teaching engagement and the relationship to detectors, ultimately what we're trying to do is get back to this core idea of multifaceted assessment of learning is the cognitive process, the, uh, uh, the affect component, as well as the social component. So that's the role of data, broadly speaking. So turning on to the, the next couple points, uh, one of the things that's really been a key emphasis to my interest in the learning process has been the idea of uh, distributed interaction and distributed knowledge generation. I wrote probably one of the worst articles ever written. That's my most cited article. And uh, it looked at, uh, it's about I guess, 16 years ago, it was this idea of connected learning or connectivism. And uh, the idea I was trying to advance is that, that we learn What's important to us as learners is not what we know, but our capacity to continue to know. So how we are located in networks starts to become a central part of this learning process and learning experience. As well, we're increasingly involved in these as part of integrated knowledge systems that have human agents, but also technological agents as part of our ability to continue to stay current and to know. And at the center is this idea of combinatorial creativity, which is can we combine and create new things? Can we take an idea that's been developed over here, an idea that's been developed over there, and put them together to create something new. And that's really, whether it's the device that is in front of you, a laptop or a phone or whatever, that's essentially the combination of many insights and research advancements that have been developed over, in some cases, centuries or even thousands of years. And in an educational process, it's really about moving past this idea of just low-level knowledge where we can name things or uh, just simply understand node structure to can we understand the meaning of relationships. And this is the, the sort of a hallmark of sophisticated knowledge where we can understand if this context changes, then these are the corresponding outputs that will be adjusted as well. And this is reflected in, for example, a few projects we're involved with. Uh, with Smart Sparrow uh, is uh, one where we're looking at the uh, it's part of the Inspark network is that essentially we want individuals to explore what is not known either to them or to others and the work of uh, colleagues like Carl uh, Breider and Marlene Scardmalia uh, has emphasized that even at a young age when kids are still you know, in, in the K-6 to system, you can start advancing hypothesis generation frameworks of learning. You can encourage students to be critical, creative, innovative thinkers, advancing a scientific theory and thinking like a scientist to explore it. So we look at compelling questions such as, are we alone or can we survive? And if you want to answer any of those questions, you know, are we alone, you essentially have to move across multiple silos. You can't answer are we alone through a biology framework. And Edgar Morin has a terrific paper that he wrote for UNESCO, um, the, the Seven Complex Lessons. And, and as a French writer, you have the typical effect of a French writer, which is beautifully written, but probably could have said it with fewer words. And, um, but that's the intent, at least this idea of we have to move outside of the silos that we exist within a university context in order to answer those kinds of questions. So um, the idea of are we alone then requires that we're looking at the big question where we look at multiple streams, you're involved in missions, that, that means you have to move across these areas, you're engaging in projects, and you're uh, continually involved in this iteration between instruction, content acquisition versus content deployment and recreation. Now this goes uh, on from a different perspective that I think we're going to face in terms of will we have courses in the long run and what does that actually look like from a course perspective. So um, the, the, uh, some of the focus here by Herbert Simon wrote a terrific uh, paper in, in 1970 sometime that looked at, uh, 1960s it appears, 
uh, the architecture of complexity. And that's this idea of what does it mean to function sort of in a complex space and what are the implications for knowledge units. So here's a simple example. He's got these two characters, Tempest and Hora, and they're basically they're, they're, they're watchmakers. And they've got a series of sub-assemblies and they're building their watches. One of them builds the entire watch in one entire unit, meaning the whole sequence. The next person builds it in pieces. So 10 blocks of 10, blocks of 10, blocks of 10, a sub-assembly of 10. And then what ends up happening is every time somebody walks in the door, the person who builds the watch in an entire sequence, all his work is lost. And then, whereas the other one is building sub-assemblies of 10, the most that he loses is 10. Because if the phone rings or somebody walks in the door, you lose 10, it's like, ah, crap, but you start again. So the view then, from an educational perspective, is that granularity and atomization of curricular resources vastly increases their capability for being repurposed. So the basic units of education then, in some cases, there's a loss, there's, there's different focuses, whether we want to call them competencies or whether we want to call them, I don't know, learning objects, or we used to call them that in the late 90s. But it's basically the reduction of the units of education from something big like a course, which is not granular and not knowledge specific. A lot of the work with badging, for example, uh, addresses the, the potential impact here. Or some of the interest in blockchain technology these days as a means of credentialing has some interesting implications too. But here's the issue that we encounter. As we break things down into smaller and smaller pieces, we have a corresponding impact, which is information fragmentation. And that's fine because the smaller a unit is, the greater its reuse can be. So if something is large and coherent, it has limited capabilities for reuse. If it's slightly smaller, it has many uses for reuse. So an hour-long lecture on statistics isn't as relevant as a very specific lecture on a specific content piece that can be reused across multiple courses. That's the problem though, that's the issue right there is once we've fragmented the conversation and the content, then we face the issue of having to stitch these together meaningfully. Now our students are doing this already, they're stitching their knowledge together by hanging out on the internet with Reddit as the font of knowledge and you've got TED Talks and you've got YouTube and you've got articles that you find on Google Scholar and a mess of other things and so students are creating a knowledge network but this knowledge network is highly fragmented with significant degree of error present. One example I often use is the idea of a private universe, which was uh, it assessed students that had graduated through uh, a school system. They were uh, graduating Harvard. And if you just search a private universe, the video goes through it. And they asked them, why do we have seasons? And I think it was something around 21 out of 23 students were unable to answer that question correctly. So they had the brightest students in the world graduating from the best system in the world were unable to answer what I would think would be a fundamental question. And the reason is that the testing mechanisms didn't surface conceptual errors. Instead, it enabled students to play the game of learning without understanding the concepts of learning. And that's the same thing that happens with students, is we don't know the things they picked up outside of our classrooms while they were searching for an answer and the kinds of things that we're doing. And so then we start to look at this idea of uh, agents in a system, according to Miller and Page's text, they only possess partial information. And in order to make sense of these, we have to connect these meaningfully. And that fundamentally has been the role of education. I mean, in an age where all of these content elements are available, I mean, it really, it has always been. It used to be in a library, though. But if these content pieces are available, then what's the point of us keeping um, keeping a university at all. Why not just let students learn through YouTube? But it's the role of a faculty member in creating coherence and in addressing conceptual errors that starts to become most central in this process. And I think going forward, especially if we have the knowledge unit in small enough pieces and if we have the idea of learner profiles or learner graphs, the idea of computed curriculum starts to become relevant, where we don't have curriculum that exists in the form of a course the way we have it today. Instead, what happens, each student is given a computed curriculum in real time, sort of the way that the distinction between an indexed view of search, like Google, versus a computed view of knowledge, such as uh, what you see with Wolfram. The view then being that smaller contextual learning experiences that are introduced, different work and life practices and process are achieved through both social and through analytic approaches. And the relevance from our end then starts to become taking a scientific framework around this type of an approach to learning where we're emphasizing um, a, a viewpoint that 
addresses complex interdependencies, meaning that we're not just interested in assessing student competence and capabilities, we're not interested in functioning in traditional institutions, we're much more interested in finding ways to address complex interdependencies and recognizing really the, the significant underpinning of education, which is just a massive if-then statement always contextual, always a function of what resources are available, and any change in one part of a system ripples across it to changes things in another part of the system. And so one of the, the things that we've emphasized through LINK is, uh, is trying to do away with traditional notions, notions of labs and space. So we, for example, have a total of uh, four doctoral students at different university systems that we fund. We have a student at Columbia, we have a student at Stanford, we have two students at Edinburgh, and the intent that we have is if we want to function in knowledge networks, we have to do away with the idea of geographically combined uh, research labs. We're very interested in creating networks of specialized and high capacity researchers, and in reality this also means that where you're located matters less. Like the idea that a student, and not everybody wants to come to Texas, I know this shocks some of you, but uh, <laughs> Um, so sometimes it's a pragmatic choice that if you want a certain type of a student, a certain type of capability to situate them in a university closer to home isn't necessarily a bad deal. So the very idea of computed curriculum and knowledge in smaller granular pieces that are created into coherent holes through the actions of faculty is also true in research activity. So it's about stopping to think of things in integrated whole systems, my lab as an integrated whole system, and instead to think of my lab as part of a broader lab network and uh, where resources, people, staff, and otherwise are located in different parts of the world. All right, last set of slides. I'll move through these quite quickly, even though some of them are fairly text heavy, and then we should have about 10 minutes for questions, if, if there are any. Is um, about three years ago, I was asked uh, to, so Alberta is located in Canada, and uh, it's a province, not a state, but it's like Texas in that we have a lot of oil. And so uh, Alberta basically was tasked with a question, or as part of this report that I wrote was, what does Alberta have to do to be a digital leader uh, by 2030? And so the process basically went, uh, I created a concept paper, which was then shared with a group of individuals. We had a series of training uh, elements for small group leaders, then we identified the key uh, topic areas, and then we held a digital learning forum where we had 200 plus senior government officials, uh, as well as the, the premier, which is also like a governor. Sorry if I'm just translating Canadian speaking. Into, into US here. I have people who make a lot of fun. For example, I call them boogers. That's what you pick out of your nose. Everybody tells me they're called boogers. And I'm just like, well, then it would be like Google rather than Google. Like, why can't I? Anyway, so we have long conversations about the pain of being a Canadian in Texas. Anyway, so we had this digital learning forum. We trained these, re these research staff to sort of go through uh, the process of moderating these discussions. And then we had uh, a series of small group uh, discussions and input where we looked at what are the major uh, questions that need to be addressed and then generate a final report on the future of, of the university. And a lot of the focus was as you would expect. I mean, you know, credentialing was a critical focus. We want new models and approaches. Uh, different views of public and academic oversight. The reality that the university is a fundamentally different enterprise than a corporation is one that, that needs to be re-emphasized. The idea of competitiveness at a global level and whether you like it or not, the growing influence of private partnerships or private involvement, uh, private sector involvement. And then of course a range of other things from deployment to infrastructure integration. And, and I'll just, there's, while there's more text, I'll just read the main parts that are relevant. But it's this idea of a multi-stakeholder approach to digital learning research, taking advantage of existing uh, digital infrastructure investments so that uh, you see a multi-stakeholder view of the university system. And we were emphasizing in, at a provincial level uh, centralizing the development deployment of digital learning because there was so much activity happening in so many schools and campuses that there was a lot of reduction of resources or duplication, I should say, of resources. But in particular, we wanted to emphasize policy considerations. This is something that hasn't received enough attention around innovation. And the, certainly it's being faced in a number of sectors. So you see US Department of Education is grappling with the policy implications of having startups that run boot camps. And even boot camps, which was interesting, I was at an event at the White House where we met with a group of individuals who, who uh, were representing different parts of the educational sector from an innovation perspective, and they were very clear they wanted, the boot camps wanted boot camps regulated because they had put the hard work in, in creating a solid enterprise and all of a sudden startups were coming up without any quality and control processes. And of course the emphasis on 
Analytics, we've already talked about, and I've already talked about the idea of a personal learning graph, which is the equivalent of a lifelong identity profile that relates to their learning and related activities. And finally, it was more of, a, of, a, of an argument then about helping individuals being capable of functioning in complex environments. And I keep coming back to this because I think that's a key component. We're still looking for what's the one thing that we need to prepare for, or what are the five things we need to prepare for as a university system going forward. The reality, it isn't that way. It's not one thing, it's many things. So we're entering this period of, of many options and many approaches, and we're not seeing that the university is changing into something completely new. Instead, we're seeing that we're, there's more added on to the obligations of a university. We still have our 18 to 22 year old learners, but now we have returning learners, and now we have a broadening scope of, of student profiles based on ethnic and related diversity and so on. So it's really about an expansion of the complexity view of what the university is and that's sort of the key challenge. So just to come back to it as the, the final slide, it's really this idea of the, the university and the role of education where we have high quality research with sophisticated data collection and a proper balance, if you will, between what can we do through technology and what do we need to do through human learning. And we have seven minutes for questions. <laughs> Questions or comments? Yeah. So George, I had this question. You talked about data earlier and, uh, and, and then about learner profiles, but a, a sort of a very broad definition of learner profiles. My question is that I don't think we are, we are in a position where we can collect all of the data that we need to sort of build the kind of learning profiles we're talking about. Yeah. So, so what kinds of thoughts do you have about how we might be able to do it in the future. Would we need to build new tools, or yeah. what direction would we have to do? Well, two things. First thing, good to see you again. Uh, second thing is, um, I, I guess it's like we, we, even now, if you look at it, if somebody was to come up to us and say, build a medical profile, and we would say, oh, I'd like this and this and this and this and this, and we'd have a lot of wish lists in it and future things that just wouldn't be possible due to you know, security of storage or due to uh, just the quality of data capture and so on. But that sophistication shouldn't prevent us from building a rudimentary one, which at one point was as simple as a, a folder that a doctor would write on and, uh, f you know, file with, with uh, their assistant. So I think it's the same challenge. You're right, we don't have all of the data, and yet if I look at it, like we can get at affect fairly well. We can understand affect and learner motivation and engagement at a degree that we couldn't. And a lot of this uh, work is being done by people in the educational data mining field, as you're aware. And so they can get at things through, uh, through simple log data and student behavioral activities that, that will know whether a learner is bored or whether they're off task. It'll even indicate whether they're gaming the system. So work that Sidney DeMello of Notre Dame uh, has done in this regard, Art Gracer out of Memphis, again, Ryan Baker I've mentioned a few times. So there's some of that work that we're already doing around affect. Social component of the graph, that's something that obviously SNA, which we imported into learning analytics from sociology, a lot of the work of Barry Wellman and others is prominent there. So we already do a fairly good job of identifying social networks that exist, information flow, directionality of information, uh, topic modeling in terms of the content exchange is also being added on to that as, as an additional component. Uh, we're we're uh, perhaps not doing as well as we could with a social and affective piece, sort of the, the beyond the engagement and the motivation, but in terms of learner sense of self and uh, related components to that. Uh, we have a, a, a student that just completed her doctorate that joined us as our uh, social affect uh, computing coordinator, uh, research scientist in the lab. And so her work is around the impact of intervention conditions like mindfulness. So if I say to you that a student that is capable of focusing for a period of time and for a task at hand is going to have a better chance future in life in terms of career and educational attainment, that's kind of like a damning thing if we don't provide a solution. And so we're looking at things like contemplative and meditative practices, uh, again, using physiological devices to capture the quality of those states, and you know, from a mindfulness perspective, to give that kind of feedback. So we could architect a learning graph in a lab. We just have to strap a lot of stuff onto people. Uh, the, uh, but from there, you can shed some of that stuff in certain settings. So some work that's been done around taking an observational 
uh, the Bronk Protocol, an observational view of what students do when they're involved in learning. And then if you compare the human observations together with the log data, you'll find that you can actually use the log data as a proxy for the human intervention. So when you remove the human intervention, the, the patterns in the log data that exist at similar times actually indicate even just because we don't know exactly why, but it matches with some of those patterns that human uh, observation was doing. So we can do a lot more than we're doing, but you're 100% right, we need to broaden data collection and become much more sophisticated in it. If I could follow up quickly, uh, everything you said makes a lot of sense, we put some of that work, but most of it has been done through systems that we have built and, and like you said, we instrument things in classrooms, etc. But how that scales up to the wild, right? Yeah. Where, where people are all over the place, and like, you, like you correctly pointed out, you're learning yeah. not just in classrooms, but a lot more outside classrooms, and who knows through what interactions, Yeah. right? So, so the, the question was, how do we, do you have any thoughts about how we might get to well, so one study that we're starting in fall at, at UTA, so we're looking, now one of the drawbacks, so we're using uh, the Empatica E4, which is a fairly sophisticated device. It's, you too can have one for just under $2,000. And uh, it's basically a watch that has none of the use of a watch. <laughs> like, there's no timepiece or anything, but, it's just, but it does a very good job of collecting uh, blood flow, arousal states, heart rate, um, yeah, and, and combined with Aspire, which we've been using, that just collects breathing patterns and then indicates states of arousal when you might be distracted or tense. So for, for about $2,000 with a couple of simple devices, we could equip students and when we will be doing a four-year study where we're looking much uh, to try and understand the, the experiences of students on campus. Uh, eventually we hope to, through better use of sensors uh, you know, and beacons, to be able to understand student movement and then hopefully, so with the E4, when a student sits down and starts a learning experience, they basically, you click a capture button, it captures 60 hours worth of data generally, but you can click event-based capture. And so if they sit down to, to read a text, it'll capture changes in activities, or if they read a web document online and so on. But even then, we're only looking at 20 students. That's not yet rolling it out into the wild, but I think before we even get the devices that'll allow us to roll out into wild, we first need to understand what is it that we can actually gain with research quality around that student in our setting. So you're absolutely right. It, getting it to a broader audience is the challenge, but I think for me at least, I still don't understand some of the basic elements right now around the device, the, the physiological data we're capturing and what, how that relates to conceptual growth, uh, knowledge growth of a student. Thanks. So at the back and then there. Yes. large-scale data collection. I'm thinking about the fact that students nowadays in their mere digital presence are already being tracked in a variety of different ways. Do you foresee any obstacles in sort of increasing the amount at which they're being tracked already? Yeah, there, are, there will be obstacles. You're wearing another device. So for example, um, so some of the staff in Link, you're wearing an Apple Watch, you're wearing a Fitbit, now you've added an Empatica 4 on, so we're gonna have to genetically modify you with another arm that comes out of your middle of your back. Um, and so, and then we're looking at a spire, which collects breathing patterns, and if we're trying to get at heart rate more effectively, you might have to wear a chest band. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. There, there are issues there. One of the things, though, that's interesting is if you can use existing devices that they have, you can minimize the negative impact on it. I think I had a lot of hopes for the Apple Watch could do that. I recall reading early on that within a 24-hour period after the Apple Watch was first released, uh, Stanford heart health researchers had more data, heart-related data captured than they had in, like, in the previous decade plus within their labs. So there is some value to that large scale of data, but we really need to see the devices become more user-friendly and less clunky. And that's sort of what's limiting in it right now. Students, by all means, I mean, they are heavily tracked. And maybe in some cases, it's about using existing data that, let's say, if you're wearing an Apple Watch, there's uh, heart data that can be captured from that, or movement data that might not need you wearing an additional device. But I think we're probably a couple of years away from where that's going to be a fairly seamless experience. Like right now, it feels like you're wearing something else. The reasons we're so willing to get tracked on our mobiles is because it's not explicit. It just happens behind the scenes while we live our lives. So it's a very relevant question. Up there and then jump down here. 
Uh, so mine was kind of a follow-on to that. There are privacy issues with this. What if people don't want all this data collected? Or what if they're willing to let you collect it for a short time, but they don't want it stored for a long-term long -term profile? Great question. Um, I think we don't recognize currently what value data has to companies. And so what I mean with that, we, I'll call it, and I wrote a co an article with a colleague in the British Journal of Educational Technology on this from a privacy end, and it's the view of uh, data as a transactional entity. We, we've, we have value for money, so if I go up to a burger place and I say, I'd like a hamburger, please, and they say that'll be $39, I'll probably say, you know, maybe I'll go down the street, because I understand $39 is a lot to pay for a hamburger. But we don't have those kinds of value metrics with our data. So if I use Facebook, and Facebook says, I want all your data, we don't understand if that's a fair transaction. If we understood, okay, you can have this and this data, and then I'll use your service. So we don't have that, but you're absolutely right. We haven't done nearly enough talking in educational settings around the data that we're collecting and what we're supposed to do with that data. It's probably one of those huge discussions like in bloom, you know, 100 million from Murdoch and Gates that was put out with the in bloom project that imploded because people didn't trust the former CEO of Microsoft and the current CEO of the News Corp. I don't know why, but that's how some people are. Yes. I think this leads to a philosophic question. To what extent does the technology change in learning or change behavior? Yeah. Well, there's some work that was done by Richie Davidson out of the University of Wisconsin, and he actually looked at it. I think it was Mathieu Ricard was the monk that he sort of uh, he did some fMRI work and some analysis and found that, that meditation structurally changes your brain. So the things that we do structurally do change our brain, and it's not that it changes it over many generations, it changes it within a lifetime. And so I'm very curious about that. Like, I was born with the attention span of a gnat, and that's that's been diminished because I'm, you know, it's like I cannot, like I hate to say this, I cannot watch a sporting event and not have a laptop with Twitter going in the background. Like, I don't know what to do. It's like, well, this is supremely boring. Now, uh, so I think other people similarly, yeah, it's doing things to us as people, the tools that we're using, some good, some bad. Uh, one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm quite heartened by is the attention that of uh, mindfulness and mindful use of technology. Uh, I did a, one of these things at uh, Massachusetts, uh, uh, what's his face, um, uh, regarding uh, John Kabat-Zinn, who's done a lot of work in, in meditation practice. He came in from a medical perspective. But, uh, so I did a week-long mindfulness retreat earlier this year where you sit and you eat mindfully, so you're supposed to taste your food rather than just swallow it. It was really weird. And then, um, so we went through this process, but it was just this idea that maybe as we become more technical as a society, the faint part of me that has hope some days says, maybe we're gonna become better humans. Like maybe we're on the cusp of a new era of music and art and creativity because the robots call it our bloody jobs. So maybe now we're gonna spend time to focusing on becoming compassionate, kind human beings. But I don't know how long I let myself get that optimistic. <laughs> Anyways, I think we're out of time. Oh, sorry, Derek, go ahead. One more question. So I guess I'm a little skeptical that I'm gonna learn more about how students learn from heart rate monitors or GPS tracking than from looking at something they've written or having a conversation with them. And I guess that's my worry that, that there's a lot of data that we can track, but is some of it just a proxy for like the stuff we're af actually after? Well, it's a great question. I mean, first of all, if I do it through data, I don't actually have to directly interact with the student. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... Uh, no, no, I, I think everything is a proxy. Like, all research is a proxy. I mean, we can't get at the human head the way we can get at a molecule or the, you know, I mean, it's because when you directly analyze it, they die. And so the, we, we do everything around learning and is proxy driven. So even when, when you provide me with writing, that writing is a proxy for your thinking and I don't understand. And so the same with the log data, it's a proxy. So we're just proxies upon proxies. The important thing to recognize is that data and personalized adaptive learning are needed because of our education system today. That means that if we had 10 students in a classroom with me interacting one-on-one -on -one with my students, I don't need software, I don't need adaptive learning analytics because I'm going to do the adapting and they will, but we don't have that setting in, in a cost reduction, classrooms are bigger, more students, and a range of other factors. So uh, the proliferation of technology is a byproduct of the type of society that we have. And Jaco Lul in his book, Technological Society, addressed this really well uh, around that we're becoming a technical society and we're creating technologies that require us to create more technologies. It, 
in order to cope. And that's really what happens. I mean, in the past when we died off and there's only 500 million of us because we had periodic plagues, uh, we had technology to make us live better, happier, longer. So now we've got 7 billion people, but that puts resources. So we can't just farm the way we used to. We got like super farm and now we need fish farms. And, and so uh, technology creates problems that only more technology can solve. That's the reality that we have. But in a perfect world, yeah, look at your students one-on-one. -on -one. And in some cases, though, I'm not saying that I want all my students architected with heart rate monitors. I am saying, though, at a, as a research question, which is separate from a practice, as a research question, I'd like to understand what's happening with these different devices physiologically with students. Later on, we can use that to inform our in-classroom practices without the use of those devices, but definitely a good question. What do you, Doug? Great. Well, thank you very much.